Day 8 The Seventh Story of the Decameron This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Miet The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio Translated by J. M. Rigg Day 8 The Seventh Story A scholar loves a widow lady, who, being enamoured of another, causes him to spend a winter's night awaiting her in the snow. He afterwards, by a stratagem, causes her to stand for a whole day in July, naked upon a tower, exposed to the flies, the gadflies, and the sun. Over the woes of poor Calandrino, the ladies laughed not a little, and had laughed yet more, but at it irked them that those that had robbed him of the pig should also take from him the capons. However, the story being ended, the queen bade Pampinea give them hers, and thus forthwith Pampinea began. Dearest ladies, it happens oftentimes that the artful scorner meets his match, wherefore tis only little wits that delight to scorn. In a series of stories we have heard tell of tricks played without aught in the way of reprisals following. By mine I purpose in some degree to excite your compassion for a gentle woman of our city, albeit the retribution that came upon her was but just, whose flout was returned in the like sort, and to such effect that she well nigh died thereof. The which to hear will not be unprofitable to you, for thereby you will learn to be more careful how you flout others, and therein you will do very wisely. Tis not many years since there dwelt at Florence a lady young and fair, and of a high spirit, and also of right gentle lineage, and tolerably well endowed with temporal goods. Now, Elena, such was the lady's name, being left a widow, was minded never to marry again, being enamoured of a handsome young gallant of her own choosing, with whom she, recking not of any other lover, did by the help of a maid in whom she placed much trust, not seldom speed the time gaily and with marvellous delight. Meanwhile it so befell that a young nobleman of our city, Rignari by name, who had spent much time in study at Paris, not that he might thereafter sell his knowledge by retail, but that he might learn the reasons and causes of things which accomplishment shows to most excellent advantage in a gentleman. Returned to Florence, and there lived as a citizen in no small honour with his fellows, both by reason of his rank and of his learning. But, as it is often the case, that those who are most versed in deep matters are the soonest mastered by love, so was it with Rignari. For at a festal gathering, to which one day he went, there appeared before his eyes this Elena, of whom we spoke, clad in black, as is the wont of our Florentine widows, and showing to his mind so much fairer and more debonair than any other woman that he had ever seen, that happy indeed he deemed the man might cool himself to whom God in his goodness should grant the right to hold her naked in his arms. So now and again he eyed her stealthily, and knowing that boons goodly and precious are not to be gotten without trouble, 
he made up his mind to study and labour with all assiduity how best to please her that he might win her love and thereby the enjoyment of her The young gentlewoman was not used to keep her eyes bent ever towards the infernal regions. But, rating herself at no less, if not more, than her deserts, she was dexterous to move them to and fro, and thus busily scanning her company, soon detected the man who regarded her with pleasure. By which means, having discovered Rinieri's passion, she inly laughed, and said, "'Twill turn out that t'was not for nothing that I came here to-day, for if I mistake not I have caught a gander by the bill." So she gave him an occasional sidelong glance, and sought as best she might to make him believe that she was not indifferent to him, deeming that the more men she might captivate by her charms the higher those charms would be rated and most especially by him whom she had made lord of them and her love the erudite scholar bade adieu to philosophical meditation for the lady entirely engrossed his mind and having discovered her house he, thinking to please her, found diverse pretexts for frequently passing by it. Whereon the lady, her vanity flattered for the reason aforesaid, plumed herself not a little, and showed herself pleased to see him. Thus encouraged, the scholar found means to make friends with her maid, to whom he discovered his love praying her to do her endeavour with her mistress, that he might have her favour. The maid was profuse of promises, and gave her mistress his message, which she no sooner heard than she was convulsed with laughter, and replied, He brought sense enough hither from Paris. Knowest thou? where he has since been to lose it. Go to now, let us give him what he seeks. Tell him, when he next speaks to you of the matter, that I love him vastly more than he loves me, but that I must have regard to my reputation, so that I may be able to hold my head up among other ladies, which if he is really the wise man they say will cause him to affect me much more ah poor woman poor woman she little knew my ladies how rash it is to try conclusions with scholars the maid found the scholar and did her mistress's errand the scholar, overjoyed, proceeded to urge his suit with more ardour, to indite letters, and send presents. The lady received all that he sent her, but vouchsafed no answers, save such as were couched in general terms. And on this wise she kept him dangling a long while. At last— Having disclosed the whole affair to her lover, who evinced some resentment and jealousy, she, to convince him that his suspicions were groundless, and for that she was much importuned by the scholar, sent word to him by her maid, that never since he had assured her of his love had occasion served her to him pleasure. But that next Christmas tide she hoped to be with him, wherefore, if he were minded to await her in the courtyard of her house on the night of the day next following the feast, she would meet him there as soon as she could. Elated as never another, the scholar hired him at the appointed time to the lady's house, and being ushered into a courtyard by the maid, who forthwith turned the key upon him, addressed himself there to await the lady's coming. Now, 
the lady's lover, by her appointment, was with her that evening, and when they had gaily supped, she told him what she had in hand that night, adding, "'And so thou wilt be able to gauge the love which I have borne and bear this scholar, whom thou hast foolishly regarded as a rival.' The lover heard the lady's words with no small delight, and waited in eager expectancy to see her make them good. The scholar, hanging about there in the courtyard, began to find it somewhat chillier than he would have liked, for it had snowed hard all day long, so that the snow lay everywhere thick on the ground. However, he bore it patiently expecting to be recompensed by and by. After a while the lady said to her lover, "'Go we to the chamber, and take a peep through a lattice at him, of whom thou art turned jealous, and mark what he does, and how he will answer the maid, whom I have bidden go speak with him.' So the pair hide them to a lattice, where through they could see without being seen, and heard the maid call from another lattice to the scholar, saying, Rinieri, my lady is distressed as never woman was, for that one of her brothers is come here to-night, and after talking a long while with her, must needs sup with her, and is not yet gone, but I think he will soon be off, and that is the reason why she has not been able to come to thee but she will come soon now. She trusts it does not irk thee to wait so long. Whereto the scholar, supposing that was true, made answer, Tell my lady to give herself no anxiety on my account until she can conveniently come to me, but to do so as soon as she may. Whereupon the maid withdrew from the window and went to bed, while the lady said to her lover, Now, what sayest thou? Thinkst thou that, if I had that regard for him, which thou fearest, I would suffer him to tarry below there to get frozen? Which said the lady and her now partly reassured lover got them to bed. Where for a great while they disported them right gamesomely, laughing together and making merry over the luckless scholar. The scholar, meanwhile, paced up and down the courtyard to keep himself warm, nor indeed had he where to sit or take shelter. In this plight he bestowed many a curse upon the lady's brother for his long tarrying, and never a sound did he hear, but he thought that t'was the lady opening the door. But vain indeed were his hopes. The lady, having solaced herself with her lover until hard upon midnight, then said to him, "'How ratest thou our scholar, my soul?' Whether is the greater his wit, or the love I bear him, thinkst thou? Will the cold, that of my ordaining, he now suffers, banish from thy breast the suspicion which my light words the other day implanted there? I indeed, heart of my body, replied the lover, well wot I now, that even as thou art to me, my weal, my consolation, my bliss, so am I to thee. So, quoth the lady, then I must have full a thousand kisses from thee to prove that thou sayest sooth. The lover's answer was to strain her to his heart, and give her not merely a thousand, but a hundred thousand kisses. In such converse they dallied a while longer, and then, "'Get we up now,' quoth the lady, "'that we may go see if tis quite spent that fire, "'with which, as he wrote to me daily, "'this new lover of mine used to burn.' 
So up they got, and hied them to the lattice, which they had used before, and, peering out into the courtyard, saw the scholar dancing a hornpipe to the music that his own teeth made, it shattering for extremity of cold. Nor had they ever seen it footed so nimbly, and at such a pace. Whereupon, "'How sayest thou, sweet my hope?' quoth the lady. "'Know I not how to make men dance without the aid of either trumpet or corn muse? "'Indeed thou dost my heart's delight,' replied the lover. "'Quoth then the lady, "'I have a mind that we go down to the door. "'Thou wilt keep quiet, and I will speak to him, "'and we shall hear what he says, "'where peradventure we shall find no less diverting than the sight of him.' So they stole softly out of the chamber and down to the door, which, leaving fast closed, the lady set her lips to a little hole that was there, and with a low voice called the scholar, who, hearing her call him, praised God, making too sure that he was to be admitted, and being come to the door, said, "'Here I am, madam, open for God's sake.' Let me in, for I die of cold. Oh, I replied the lady, I know thou hast a chill, and of course there being a little snow about, tis mighty cold, but well I wot the nights are cold afar at Paris. I cannot let thee in as yet, because my accursed brother that came to sup here this evening is still with me. But he will soon take himself off, and then I will let thee in without a moment's delay. I have but now with no small difficulty given him the slip, to come and give thee heart, that the waiting irk thee not. Nay, but, madam, replied the scholar, for the love of God, I entreat you, let me in, that I may have a roof over my head because for some time past there has been never so thick a fall of snow, and tis yet snowing, and then I will wait as long as you please. Alas, sweet my love, quoth the lady, that I may not, for this door makes such a din when one opens it that my brother would be sure to hear were I to let thee in but I will go tell him to get him gone, and so come back and admit thee. Go at once, then, returned the scholar, and prithee, see that a good fire be kindled, that when I get in I may warm myself, for I am now so chilled through and through that I have scarce any feeling left. That can scarce be, rejoined the lady, if it be true. What thou hast protested in thy letters, that thou art all afire for love of me, tis plain to me now that thus did but mock me. I now take my leave of thee. Wait and be of good cheer. So the lady and her lover, who, to his immense delight, had heard all that had passed, betook them to bed. However, little sleep they had that night, but spent the best part of it in disporting themselves and making merry over the unfortunate scholar, who, his teeth now chattering to such a tune that he seemed to have been metamorphosed into a stork, perceived that he had been befooled. And after making diverse fruitless attempts to open the door, and seeking means of egress to no better purpose, paced to and fro like a lion, cursing the villainous weather, the long night, his simplicity, and the perversity of the lady, against whom the vehemence of his wrath suddenly converting the love he had so long borne to her bitter and remorseless enmity, he now plotted within himself diverse and grand schemes of revenge, on which he was far more bent than ever he had been on foregathering with her. 
slowly the night wore away and with the first streaks of dawn the maid by her mistress's direction came down opened the door of the courtyard and putting on a compassionate air greeted Rinieri with foul fool him that came here yestereve he has afflicted us with his presence all night long and has kept thee a freezing up here but hark ye take it not amiss that which might not be to-night shall be another time well wot i not could have befallen that my lady could so ill brook for all his wrath the scholar witting like the wise man he was that menaces serve but to put the menace on his guard kept pent within his breast that which unbridled resentment would have uttered and said quietly and without betraying the least trace of anger in truth it was the worst night i ever spent but i understand quite well that the lady was in no wise to blame for that she herself being moved to pity of me came down here to make her excuses and to comfort me and as thou sayest what has not been to-night will be another time wherefore commend me to her and so adieu then well night paralyzed for cold he got him as best as he might home where weary and fit to die for drowsiness he threw himself on his bed and fell into a deep sleep from which he awoke to find that he had all but lost the use of his arms and legs he therefore sent some physicians and having told them what a chill he had gotten caused them to have a care to his health but though they treated him with active and most drastic remedies it cost them some time and no little trouble to restore to the cramped muscles their wonted pliancy and indeed but for his youth and the milder weather that was at hand it would have gone very hard with him however recover he did his health and lustihood and nursing his enmity feigned to be vastly more enamoured of his widow than ever before and so it was that after a while fortune furnished him with an opportunity of satisfying his resentment for the gallant of whom the widow was enamoured utterly regardless of the love she bore him grew enamoured of another lady and was minded no more to pleasure the widow in aught either by word or by deed wherefore she now pined in tears and bitterness of spirit however her maid who commiserated her not a little and knew not how to dispel the dumps that the loss of her lover had caused her espying the scholar pass along the street as he had been wont conceived the silly idea that the lady's lover might be induced to return to his old love by some practice of a necromantic order wherein she doubted not that the scholar must be a thorough adept which idea she imparted to her mistress the lady being none too well furnished with sense never thinking that if the scholar had been an adept in necromancy he would have made use of it in his own behoof gave heed to what her maid said and forthwith bade her learn of the scholar whether he would plan his skill at her service and assure him that if he did so she in guerdon and thereof would do his pleasure the maid did her mistress's errand well and faithfully the scholar no sooner heard the message than he said to himself 
praised be thy name o god that the time is now come when with thy help i may be avenged upon this wicked woman of the wrong she did me in requital of the great love i bore her then turning to the maid he said tell my lady to set her mind at ease touching this matter for that were her lover in india i would forthwith bring him hither to crave her pardon of that wherein he has offended her as to the course she should take in the matter i tarry but her pleasure to make it known to her when and where she may think fit tell her so and bid her from me to be of good cheer the maid carried his answer to her mistress and arranged that they should meet in the church of Santa Lucia of Prato. Thither, accordingly, they came, the lady and the scholar, and conversed apart, and the lady quite oblivious of the ill usage by which she had well nigh done him to death, opened all her mind to him and besought him if he had any regard to her welfare to aid her to the attainment of her desire madam replied the scholar true it is that among other law that i acquired at paris was this of necromancy whereof indeed i know all that may be known but as tis in the last degree displeasing to god i had sworn never to practise it either for my own or for any other's behoof tis also true that the love i bear you is such that i know not how to refuse you aught that you would have me do for you and so were this single essay enough to consign me to hell i would adventure it to pleasure you but I mind me that tis a matter scarce so easy of performance, as perchance you suppose, most especially when a woman would fain recover the love of a man, or a man that of a woman, for then it must be done by the postulant in proper person, and at night, and in lonely places, and unattended, so that it needs a stout heart nor know i whether you are disposed to comply with these conditions the lady too enamoured to be discreet made answer so shrewdly does love goad me that there is not i would not do to bring him back to me who wrongfully has deserted me but tell me prithee wherein it is that i have need of this stout heart madam returned the despiteful scholar twill be my part to fashion in tin an image of him you would fain lure back to you and when i have sent you the image twill be for you when the moon is well on the wane to dip yourself being stark naked and the image seven times in a flowing stream and this you must do quite alone about the hour of first sleep and afterwards still naked you must get you upon some tree or some deserted house and facing the north with the image in your hand say certain words that i shall give you in writing seven times which when you have done there will come to you two damsels the fairest you ever saw who will greet you graciously and ask of you what you would fain have to whom you will disclose frankly and fully all that you crave and see to it that you make no mistake in the name and when you have said all they will depart and you may then descend and return to the spot where you left your clothes and resume them and go home and rest assured that before the ensuing midnight your lover will come to you in tears and crave your pardon and mercy 
and that thenceforth he will never again desert you for any other woman. The lady gave entire credence to the scholar's words, and deeming her lover as good as in her arms again, recovered half her wonted spirits. Wherefore, make no doubt, quoth she, that I shall do as thou bidst. And indeed I am most favoured by circumstance, for in Upper Valdarno I have an estate adjoining the river, and tis now July, so that to bathe will be delightful. Ay, and now I mind me that at no great distance from this river there is a little tower, which is deserted, save that now and again the shepherds will get them up by the chestnut wood ladder to the roof, thence to look out for their strayed sheep. "'Tis a place lonely indeed, and quite out of ken. "'And when I have clomb it, and climb it I will, "'I doubt not twill be the best place in all the world "'to give effect to your instructions.' "'Well pleased to be certified of the lady's intention, "'the scholar to whom her estate and the tower were very well known made answer.' I was never in those parts, madam, and therefore know neither your estate nor the tower. But, if it is as you say, it will certainly be the best place in the world for your purpose. So, when time shall serve, I will send you the image and the horizon. But I pray you, when you shall have your heart's desire, and know that I have done you good service, do not forget me. But keep your promise to me. That will I without fail, quoth the lady, and so she bade him farewell, and went home. The scholar, gleefully anticipating the success of his enterprise, fashioned an image, and inscribed it with certain magical signs, and wrote some gibberish, by way of ricin, which in due time he sent to the lady bidding her the very next night do as he had prescribed, and thereupon he hied him privily with one of his servants to the house of a friend hard by the tower, there to carry his purpose into effect. The lady, on her part, set out with her maid, and betook her to her estate, and, night being come, sent the maid to bed as if she were minded to go to rest herself, and about the hour of first sleep stole out of the house and down to the tower beside the Arno. And when, having carefully looked about her, she was satisfied that never a soul was to be seen or heard, she took off her clothes and hid them under a bush. Then, with the image in her hand, she dipped herself seven times in the river, which done she hied her with the image to the tower. The scholar, having at nightfall couched himself with his servant among the willows and other trees that fringed the bank, marked all that she did, and how, as she passed by him, the whiteness of her flesh dispelled the shades of night, and scanning attentively her bosom and every other part of her body, and finding them very fair, felt, as he bethought him what would shortly befall them, some pity of her. While, on the other hand, he was suddenly assailed by the solicitations of the flesh which caused that to stand which had been inert, and prompted him to sally forth of his ambush and take her by force and have his pleasure on her. And, what with his compassion, and passion he was like to be worsted. But then, as he bethought him who he was, and what a grievous wrong had been done him, and for what cause, and by whom, his wrath, thus rekindled, got the better of the other affections, so that he swerved not from his resolve, but suffered her to go her way. the lady ascended the tower, and standing with her face to the north began to recite the scholar's horizon, 
while he, having stolen into the tower but a little behind her, cautiously shifted the ladder that led up to the roof on which the lady stood, and waited to observe what she would say and do. Seven times the lady said the horizon, and then awaited the appearance of the two damsels, and so long had she to wait, not to mention that the night was a good deal cooler than she would have liked, that she saw daybreak, whereupon disconcerted that it had not fallen out as the scholar had promised, she said to herself, I misdoubt me he was minded to give me such a night as I gave him, but if such was his intent, he is but maladroit in his revenge, for this night is not as long by a third as his was, besides which the cold is of another quality. And that day might not overtake her there. She began to think of descending, but finding that the ladder was removed, she felt as if the world had come to naught beneath her feet. Her senses reeled, and she fell in a swoon upon the floor of the roof. When she came to herself, she burst into tears and piteous lamentations, and witting now very well that t'was the doing of the scholar, she began to repent her that she had first offended him. And then, trusting him unduly, having such good cause to reckon upon his enmity, in which frame she abode long time. Then searching, if haply she might find some means of descent, and finding none, she fell a-weeping again, and bitterly to herself she said, Alas for thee, wretched woman! What will thy brothers, thy kinsmen, thy neighbours, nay, what will all Florence say of thee? when tis known that thou hast been found here naked. Thy honour, hitherto unsuspect, will be known to have been but a show. And shouldst thou seek thy defence in lying excuses, if any such may be fashioned, the accursed scholar who knows all thy doings will not suffer it. Ah, poor wretch, that at one and the same time hast lost thy too dearly cherished gallant and thine own honour. And therewith she was taken with such a transport of grief, that she was like to cast herself from the tower to the ground. Then, bethinking her that if she might espy some lad making towards the tower with his sheep, she might send him for the maid, for the sun was now risen. She approached one of the parapets of the tower, and looked out, and so it befell that the scholar, awakening from a slumber, in which he had lain a while at the foot of a bush, espied her, and she him. Whereupon, "'Good day, madam,' quoth he. "'Are the damsels yet come?' The lady saw and heard him not without bursting afresh into a flood of tears, and besought him to come into the tower that she might speak with him, a request which the scholar very courteously granted. The lady then threw herself prone on the floor of the roof, and, only her head being visible through the aperture, thus through her sobs she spoke. Verily, Rignari, if I gave thee a bad night, thou art well avenged on me. For though it be July, me seemed I was sore a cold last night, standing here with never a thread upon me. And besides, I have so bitterly bewept both the trick I played thee and my own folly in trusting thee, that I marvel that I still have eyes in my head. Whereupon I implore thee, not for love of me, whom thou hast no cause to love, but for the respect thou hast for thyself as a gentleman, that thou let that which thou hast already done suffice thee to avenge the wrong I did thee, and bring me my clothes, that I may be able to get me down from here, and spare to take me from that which, however thou mightst hereafter wish, thou couldst not restore to me. 
my honour, to wit, my honour, whereas if I deprived thee of that one night with me, tis in my power to give thee many another night in recompense thereof, and thou hast but to choose thine own times. Let this, then, suffice, and like a worthy gentleman to be satisfied to have taken thy revenge, and to have let me know it. Put not forth thy might against a woman, tis no glory to the eagle to have vanquished a dove. Wherefore, for God's and thine own honour's sake, have mercy on me. The scholar, albeit his haughty spirit still brooded on her evil entreatment of him, yet saw her not weep and supplicate without a certain compunction mingling with his exultation. But vengeance he had desired above all things. To have wreaked it was indeed sweet, and albeit his humanity prompted him to have compassion on the hapless woman, yet it availed not to subdue the fierceness of his resentment. Wherefore thus he made answer, Madame Elena, had my prayers, albeit art I had none to mingle with them tears and honeyed words as thou dost with thine, inclined thee that night, where I stood perishing with cold amid the snow that filled thy courtyard, to accord me the very least shelter. Twere but a light matter for me to hearken now to thine. But— if thou art now so much more careful of thy honour than thou wast wont to be, and it irks thee to tarry there naked, address thy prayers to him, in whose arms it irked thee not naked to pass that night thou mightst thee of. Albeit thou wist that I with hasty foot was beating time upon the snow in thy courtyard to the accompaniment of chattering teeth, "'Tis he that thou shouldst call to succour thee, to fetch thy clothes, to adjust the ladder for thy descent. "'Tis he in whom thou shouldst labour to inspire this tenderness now, thou showest for thy honour. "'That honour which for his sake thou hast not sculpted to jeopardise both now and on a thousand other occasions.' Why, then, cause thou not him to come to thy succour? To whom pertains it rather than to him? Thou art his. And of whom will he have a care? Whom will he succour, if not thee? Thou asked him that night, when thou wast wantoning with him, whether seemed to him the greater, my folly, or the love thou didst bear him. Call him now, foolish woman, and see if the love thou bearest him, and thy wit and his, may avail to deliver thee from my folly. Tis now no longer in thy power to show me courtesy of that which I no more desire, nor yet to refuse it did I desire it. Reserve thy nights for thy lover, if so be thou, go hence alive. Be they all thine and his. One of them was more than I cared for. Tis enough for me to have been flouted once. I, and by thy cunning of speech thou strivest might and main to conciliate my good will, calling me worthy gentleman by which insinuation thou wouldst fain induce me magnanimously to desist from further chastisement of thy baseness. But thy cajoleries shall not now cloud the eyes of my mind, as did once thy false promises. I know myself, and better now for thy one night's instruction than for all the time I spent at Paris. But, granted that I were disposed to be magnanimous, thou art not of those to whom tis meet to show magnanimity. O wild beast such as thou, having merited vengeance, can claim no relief from suffering save death. Though in the case of a human being, 
twould suffice to temper vengeance with mercy, as thou saidst. Wherefore I, albeit no eagle, witting thee, to be no dove, but a venomous serpent, mankind's most ancient enemy, am minded, baiting no jot of malice or of might, to hurry thee to the bitter end. Nevertheless, this, which I do, is not properly to be called vengeance, but rather just retribution, seeing that vengeance should be in excess of the offence, and this my just of thee will fall short of it. For were I minded to be avenged on thee, considering what account thou madest of my heart and soul, t'would not suffice me to take thy life, no, nor the lives of a hundred others such as thee. For I should but slay a vile and base and wicked woman. And what the devil art thou more than any other pitiful baggage, that I should spare thy little store of beauty, which a few years will ruin, covering my face with wrinkles. And yet t'was not for want of will that thou dost fail to do a death a worthy gentleman, as thou but now did call me, of whom in a single day of his life the world may well have more profit than of a hundred thousand like thee while the world shall last. Wherefore, by this rude discipline, I will teach thee what it is to flout men of spirit, and more especially what it is to flout scholars, that if thou escape with thy life, thou mayst have good cause ever hereafter to shun such folly. But if thou art so fain to make the descent, why not cast thyself down, whereby, God helping, thou wouldst at once break thy neck? Be quit of the torment thou endurest, and make me the happiest man alive. I have no more to say to thee. Twas my art and craft thus caused thee climb. Be it thine to find the way down. Thou hadst cunning enough when thou wast minded to flout me. While the scholar thus spoke, the hapless lady wept incessantly and before he had done to aggravate her misery the sun was high in the heaven however when he was silent thus she made answer ah ruthless man if that accursed knight has so rankled with thee and thou deemest my fault so grave that neither my youth and beauty nor my bitter tears nor yet my humble supplications may move thee to pity let this at least move thee, and abate somewhat of thy remorseless severity. That was my act alone, in that of late I trusted thee, and discovered to thee all my secret, that did open the way to compass thy end, and make me cognizant of my guilt, seeing that, had I not confided in thee on no wise, mightest thou have been avenged on me which thou wouldst seem so ardently to have desired. Turn thee then, turn thee, I pray thee, from thy wrath, and pardon me. So thou wilt pardon me, and get me down hence, right gladly will I give up for ever my faithless gallant, and thou shalt be my sole lover and lord, albeit thou says hard things of my beauty, slight and short-lived as thou would have it to be, which, however it may compare with others, is I walk to be prized, if for no other reason, yet for this, that tis the admiration and solace and delight of young men, and thou art not yet old. And albeit I have been harshly treated by thee, yet believe I cannot that thou wouldst have me do myself so shamefully to death as to cast me down, like some abandoned wretch before thine eyes, in which, unless thou wast then, as thou hast since shown thyself a liar, I found such favour. Ah, have pity on me for God's and mercy's sake, the sun waxes exceedingly hot, 
and having suffered not a little by the cold of last night, I now begin to be sorely afflicted by the heat. Madam, rejoined the scholar, who held her in parley with no small delight, "'Twas not for any love that thou didst bear me that thou trusts me, but that thou mightst recover that which thou hadst lost, for which cause thou meritest but the greatest punishment, and foolish indeed art thou if thou suppose that such was the sole means available for my revenge. I had a thousand others, and while I feigned to love thee, I had lain a thousand gins for thy feet, into one or other of which in no long time, though this had not occurred, thou must needs have fallen, and that too to thy more grievous suffering and shame, nor was it to spare thee, but that I might be the sooner rejoiced by this thy discomfiture than I took my present course. And though all other means had failed me, I had still the pen, with which I would have written of thee such matters, and in such a sort, that when thou wist them, as thou should have done, thou wouldst have regretted a thousand times that thou had ever been born. The might of the pen is greater far than they suppose, who have not proved it by experience. By God I swear, so may he who has prospered me thus far in this my revenge, prosper me to the end, that I would have written of thee things that would have so shamed thee in thine own, not to speak of others' sight, that thou hast pulled out thine eyes, that thou mightst no more see thyself. Wherefore chide not the sea, for that it has sent forth a tiny rivulet. For thy love, or whether thou be mine or no, not care I. Be thou still his, whose thou hast been, if thou canst. Hate him, as I once did. I now love him by reason of his present entreatment of thee. Ye go getting you enamoured, ye women. And naught will satisfy you but young gallants, because ye mark that their flesh is ruddier, and their beards are blacker than other folks, and that they carry themselves well and foot it featly in the dance and joust. But those that are now more mature were even as they, and possess a knowledge which they have yet to acquire. And therewithal ye deem that they ride better and cover more miles in a day than men of riper age. Now that they dust their pelis with more vigour, I certainly allow. But their seniors, being more experienced, know better the places where the fleas lurk, and spare and dainty diet is preferable to abundance without savour. Moreover, hard trotting will gull, and jade even the youngest, whereas an easy pace, though it bring one somewhat later to the inn, at any rate brings one thither fresh. Ye discern not witless creatures that ye are, how much of evil this little show of bravery serves to hide. Your young gallant is neither content with one woman, but lusts after as many as he sets eyes on. Nor is there any but he deems himself worthy of her. Wherefore it is not possible that their love should be lasting, as thou hast but now proved and may only too truly witness. Moreover, to be worshipped, to be caressed by their ladies they deem but their due, nor is there aught whereon they plume and boast them so proudly as their conquests, which impertinence has caused not a few women to surrender to the friars who keep their own counsel. Peradventure thou wilt say that never a soul, save thy maid and I, wist aught of thy loves. But if so, thou hast been misinformed, and if thou so believest, thou dost misbelieve. 
scarce aught else is talked of either in his quarter or in thine. But most often tis those most concerned, whose ears such matters reach last. Moreover they rob you, these young gallants, whereas the others make you presents. So then, having made a bad choice, be thou still his to whom thou hast given thyself, and leave me whom thou didst flout to another. For I have found a lady of much greater charms than thine, and that has understood me better than thou didst. And that thou mayst get to thee to the other world better certified of the desire of my eyes than thou wouldst seem to be here by my words, delay no more, but cast thyself down, whereby thy soul, taken forthwith, as I doubt not she will be, into the embrace of the devil. May see whether thy headlong fall afflicts mine eyes or no. But for that I doubt thou mean'st not thus to gladden me. I bid thee, if thou find'st the sun begin to scorch thee, remember the cold thou didst cause me to endure, wherewith by admixture thou mayst readily temper the sun's heat. The hapless lady, seeing that the scholar's words were ever to the same ruthless effect, burst afresh into tears, and said, Lo, now, since naught that pertains to me may move thee, be thou at least moved by the love thou bearest, this lady of whom thou speakest, whom thou sayest is wiser than I, and loves thee, and for love of her pardon me, and fetch me my clothes, so that I may resume them, and get me down hence. Whereat the scholar fell a-laughing, and seeing that twas not a little past tears made answer lo now i know not how to deny thee adjuring me as thou dost by such a lady tell me then where thy clothes are and i will go fetch them and bring thee down the lady believing him was somewhat comforted and told him where she had laid her clothes the scholar then quitted the tower, bidding his servant on no account to stir from his post, but to keep close by, and, as best he might, bar the tower against all comers until his return, which, he said, he betook him to the house of his friend, where he breakfasted much at his ease, and thereafter went to sleep. Left alone upon the tower, the lady, somewhat cheered by her fond hope, but still exceeding sorrowful, drew nigh to a part of the wall where there was a little shade, and there sat down to wait. And now lost in most melancholy brooding, now dissolved in tears, now plunged in despair of ever seeing the scholar return with her clothes, but never more than a brief while in any one mood, spent with grief and the night's vigil, she by and by fell asleep. The sun was now in the zenith, and smote with extreme fervour, full and unmitigated upon her tender and delicate frame, and upon her bare head, insomuch that his rays did not only scot, but bit by bit excoriate every part of her flesh that was exposed to them, and so shrewdly burned her, that, albeit she was in a deep sleep, the pain awoke her. And, as by reason thereof, she writhed a little, she felt the scorched skin part in sunder and shed itself, as will happen when one tugs at a parchment that has been singed by the fire, while her head ached so sore that it seemed like to split, and no wonder. Nor might she find place either to lie or stand on the floor of the roof, but ever went to and fro, weeping. Besides which there stirred not the least breath of wind, and flies and gadflies did swarm in prodigious quantity, which, settling upon her excoriate flesh, stung her so shrewdly that twas as if she received so many stabs with a javelin, and she was ever restlessly feeling her sores with her hands and cursing herself, her life, her lover, and the scholar. Thus, 
by the exorbitant heat of the sun, by the flies and gadflies, harassed, goaded, and lacerated, tormented also by hunger, and yet more by thirst, and there too by a thousand distressful thoughts, she planted herself erect on her feet, and looked about her, if haply she might see or hear any one, with intent, come what might, to call to him and crave his succour. But even this hostile fortune had disallowed her. The husbandmen were all gone from the fields by reason of the heat, and indeed there had come none to work that day in the neighbourhood of the tower, for that all were employed in the threshing of their corn beside the cottages, wherefore she heard but the cicalas, while Arno, tantalising her with the sight of his waters, increased rather than diminished her thirst. Aye, and in like manner, wherever she espied a copse, or a patch of shade, or a house, it was a torment to her, for the longing she had for it. What more is to be said of this hapless woman? Only this, that what with the heat of the sun above and the floor beneath her, and the scarification of her flesh in every part by the flies and gadflies, that flesh, which in the night had dispelled the gloom by its whiteness, was now become red as madder, and so bespent with clots of blood, that whoso had seen her would have deemed her the most hideous object in the world. Thus, resourceless and hopeless, she passed the long hours, expecting death rather than aught else, until half none was come and gone. When his siesta ended, the scholar bethought him of his lady, and being minded to see how she fared, hied him back to her tower and sent his servant away to break his fast. As soon as the lady espied him, she came, spent and crushed by her sore affliction, to the aperture, and thus addressed him. Rinieri, the cup of thy vengeance is full to overflowing, for if I gave thee a night of freezing in my courtyard, thou hast given me upon this tower a day of scorching nay, of burning, and therewithal of perishing, of hunger and thirst. Wherefore, by God, I entreat thee to come up hither, and, as my heart fails me, to take my life. Take it thou, for it is death I desire of all things, such and so grievous is my suffering. But if this grace thou wilt not grant, at least bring me a cup of water wherewith to lave my mouth for which my tears do not suffice, so parched and torrid is it within. Well wist the scholar by her voice how spent she was. He also saw a part of her body burned through and through by the sun, whereby, and by reason of the lowliness of her entreaties, he felt some little pity for her. But all the same he made answer, Nay, wicked woman! "'Tis not by my hands thou shalt die. "'Thou canst die by thine own, whenever thou art so minded. "'And to temper thy heat, thou shalt have just as much water from me "'as I had fire from thee to mitigate my cold. "'I only regret that, for the cure of my chill, "'the physicians were fain to use foul-smelling muck, "'whereas thy burns can be treated with fragrant rose-water. "'And that... Whereas I was like to lose my muscles and the use of my limbs, thou, for all thy excoriation by the heat, wilt yet be fair again like a snake that has sloughed off the old skin. Alas, woe is me, replied the lady, for charms acquired at such a cost, gr God grant them to those that hate me. But thou, most fell of all wild beast, how hast thou borne thus to torture me? What more had I to expect of thee or any other had I done all thy kith and kin to death with direct torments? Verily, I know not what more cruel suffering thou couldst have inflicted on a traitor that had put a whole city to the slaughter than this which thou hast allotted to me, to be thus roasted and devoured 
of the flies, and therewithal to refuse me even a cup of water, though the very murderers condemned to death by the law, as they go to execution, not seldom are allowed wine to drink. So but they ask it. Lo, now, I see that thou art inexorable in thy ruthlessness, and on no wise to be moved by my suffering. Wherefore, with resignation, I will compose me to await death, that God may have mercy on my soul. And may this, that thou dost escape not in the searching glance of his just eyes. Which said, she dragged herself sore suffering towards the middle of the floor, despairing of ever escaping from her fiery torment. Besides which, not once only, but a thousand times, she thought to choke for thirst. And ever she wept bitterly, and bewailed her evil fate. But at length the day wore to Vespers, and the scholar, being sated with his revenge, caused his servant to take her clothes and wrap them in his cloak, and hide him with the servant to the hapless lady's house where, finding her maid sitting disconsolate and woebegone and resourceless at the door. "'Good woman,' quoth he, "'what has befallen thy mistress?' "'Where to?' "'Sir, I know not,' replied the maid. "'I looked to find her this morning abed, "'for methought she went to bed last night, "'but neither there nor anywhere else could I find her. "'Nor know I what is become of her.' Wherefore exceeding great is my distress, but have you, sir, not to say of the matter? Only this, returned the scholar, that I would I had had thee with her there where I have had her, that I might have requited thee of thy offence, even as I have requited her of hers. But be assured that thou shalt not escape my hands, until thou hast from me such wage of thy labours, that thou shalt never flout man more. But thou shalt mind thee of me. Then, turning to his servant, he said, Give her these clothes, and tell her that she may go bring her mistress away, if she will. The servant did his bidding, and the maid, what with the message and her recognition of the clothes, was mightily afraid, lest they had slain the lady, and scarce suppressing a shriek, took the clothes, and bursting into tears, set off, as soon as the scholar was gone, at a run for the tower. Now, one of the lady's husbandmen had had the misfortune to lose two of his hogs that day, and seeking them came to the tower not long after the scholar had gone thence, and peering about in all quarters, if haply he might have sight of his hogs, heard the woeful lamentation that the hapless lady made, and got him up into the tower, and called out as loud as he might, Who wails up there? The lady recognized her husband's voice, and called him by name, saying, Prithee, go fetch my maid, and cause her come up to hither to me. The husbandman, knowing her by her voice, replied, Alas, madam, who set you there? Your maid has been seeking you all day long, but who would have supposed that you were there? Whereupon he took the props of the ladder and set them in position, and proceeded to secure the rounds to them with withies. Thus engaged, he was found by the maid, who, as she entered the tower, beat her face and breast, and, unable longer to keep silence, cried out, Alas, sweet my lady, where are you? Whereto the lady made answer, as loud as she might, O oh, my sister, here above I am I, weep not, but fetch my clothes forthwith. Well nigh restored her heart to hear her mistress's voice, the maid, assisted by the husbandman, ascended the ladder, which he had now all but set in order, and gaining the roof, and seeing her lady lie there naked, spent and fordone, and liker to a half-burned stump than to a human being, she planted her nails in her face, and fell a-weeping over her, as if she were a corpse. However, the lady bade her for God's sake be silent, and help her to dress, and having learned from her that none knew where she had been save those that had brought 
her her clothes and the husbandman that was there present was somewhat consoled and besought her for god's sake to say naught of the matter to any thus long time they conversed and the husbandman took the lady on his shoulders for walk she could not and bore her safely out of the tower the unfortunate maid following after with somewhat less caution slipped and falling down from the ladder to the ground broke her thigh and roared for pain like any lion so the husbandman set the lady down upon a grassy mead while he went to see what had befallen the maid whom finding her thigh broken he brought and laid beside the lady who seeing her woes completed by this last misfortune and that she of whom most of all she had expected succour was lamed of a thigh was distressed beyond measure and wept again so piteously that not only was the husbandman powerless to comfort her but was himself fain to weep however as the sun was now low that they might not be there surprised by night he with the disconsolate lady's appeal hied him home and called to his aid two of his brothers and his wife who returned with him bearing a plank whereon they laid the maid and so they carried her to the lady's house there by dint of cold water and words of cheer they restored some heart to the lady whom the husbandman then took upon his shoulders and bore to her chamber the husbandman's wife fed her with sops of bread and then undressed her and put her to bed they also provided the means to carry her and the maid to florence and so it was done there the lady who was very fertile in artifices invented an entirely fictitious story of what had happened as well in regard of her maid as of herself whereby she persuaded both her brothers and her sisters and every one else that was all due to the enchantment of evil spirits the physicians lost no time and albeit the lady's suffering and mortification were extreme for she left more than one skin sticking to the sheets they cured her of a high fever and certain attendant maladies as also the maid of her fractured thigh the end of all which was that the lady forgot her lover and having learned discretion was thenceforth careful never to love nor to flout and the scholar learning that the maid had broken her thigh deemed his vengeance complete and was satisfied to say never a word more of the affair such then were the consequences of her flout to his foolish young woman who deemed that she might trifle with a scholar with the like impunity as with others not duly understanding that they i say not all but the most part know where the devil keeps his tail wherefore my ladies have a care how you flout men and more especially scholars end of day eight the seventh story recording by miette of miette's bedtime story podcast Day 8. The Eighth Story of the Decameron This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gesine The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio Translated by J. M. Rigg Day 8. The Eighth Story Two men keep with one another, the one lies with the other's wife, the other, being ware thereof, manages with the aid of his wife to have the one locked in a chest, upon which he then lies with the wife of him that is locked therein. Grievous and distressful was it to the ladies to hear how it fared with Elena, but as they accounted the retribution in a measure righteous, they were satisfied to expend upon her but a moderate degree of compassion albeit they censured the scholar as severe 
intemperately relentless, and indeed ruthless, in his vengeance. However, Pompinea, having brought the story to a close, the queen bade Fiametta follow suit, and prompt to obey, Fiametta thus spoke. Debonair, my ladies, as methinks your feelings must have been somewhat harrowed by the severity of the resentful scholar, I deem it meet to soothe your vexed spirits with something of a more cheerful order. Wherefore I am minded to tell you a little story of a young man who bore an affront in a milder temper, and avenged himself with more moderation. Whereby you may understand that one should be satisfied if the ass and the wall are quits, nor by indulging a vindictive spirit to excess, turn the requital of a wrong into an occasion of wrongdoing. You are to know, then, that at Siena, as I have heard tell, there dwelt two young men of good substance, and, for plebeians, of good family, the one Spinelocho Tanena, the other Zeppa di Mino by name, who, their houses being contiguous in the Camolia, kept ever together, and, by what appeared, loved each other as brothers, or even more so, and had each a very fine woman to wife. Now it so befell that Spinelocho, being much in Zeppa's house, as well when Zeppa was not as when he was there, grew so familiar with Zeppa's wife, that he sometimes lay with her. And on this wise they continued to foregather a great while before any one was aware of it. However, one of these days, Zeppa being at home, though his lady wist it not, Spinelocho came in quest of him, and, the lady sending word that he was not at home, he forthwith went upstairs, and found the lady in the saloon, and seeing none else there, kissed her, as she did him. Zeppa saw all that passed, but said nothing, and kept close, being minded to see how the game would end, and soon saw his wife and Spinelocho, still in one another's arms, hie them to her chamber, and lock themselves in, whereat he was mightily incensed. But, witting that to make a noise, or do aught else overt, would not lessen but rather increase his dishonour, he cast about how he might be avenged on such wise that, without the affair getting wind, he might content his soul, and having, after long pondering, hit, as he thought, upon the expedient, he budged not from his retreat until Spinelocho had parted from the lady. Whereupon he hied him into the chamber, and there finding the lady with her headgear, which Spinelocho in toying with her had disarranged, scarce yet readjusted. Madam, what dost thou? quoth he. Where to? Why, dost not see? returned the lady. Troth do I, rejoined he, and somewhat else have I seen that I would I had not. And so he questioned her of what had passed, and she, being mightily afraid, did after long parley confess that which she might not plausibly deny, to wit her intimacy with Spinelocho, and fell a-beseeching him with tears to pardon her. Lo now, wife, quoth Zeppa, thou hast done wrong, and so thou wouldst have me pardon thee, have a care to do exactly as I shall bid thee, to wit, on this wise. Thou must tell Spinelocho to find some occasion to part from me to-morrow morning about tears, and come hither to thee, and while he is here I will come back, and when thou hearest me coming, thou wilt get him into this chest, and lock him in there, which when thou hast done, I will tell thee what else thou hast to do, which thou mayst do without the least misgiving, for I promise thee I will do him no harm. The lady, to content him, promised to do as he bade, and she kept her word. The morning came, and Zeppa and Spinelocho being together about tears, Spinelocho, having promised the lady to come to see her at that hour, said to Zeppa, I must go breakfast with a friend, whom I had life not keep in waiting. Therefore adieu. Nay, but, quoth Zeppa, tis not yet breakfast-time. No matter, 
returned Spinelotro. I have business on which I must speak with him, so I must be in good time. Whereupon Spinelotro took his leave of Zeppa, and having reached Zeppa's house, by a slightly circuitous route, and finding his wife there, was taken by her into the chamber, where they had not been long together, when Zeppa returned. Hearing him come, the lady, feigning no small alarm, bundled Spinelotro into the chest, as her husband had bidden her, and having locked him in, left him there. As Zeppa came upstairs, "'Wife,' quoth he, "'is it breakfast-time?' "'Aye, husband, tis so,' replied the lady. Whereupon, "'Spinelotro is gone to breakfast with a friend to-day,' quoth Zeppa, "'leaving his wife at home. Get thee to the window, and call her, and bid her come and breakfast with us.' The lady, whose fear for herself made her mighty obedient, did as her husband bade her, and after much pressing Spinelotra's wife came to breakfast with them, though she was given to understand that her husband would not be of the company. So, she being come, Zeppa received her most affectionately, and, taking her familiarly by the hand, bade his wife, in an undertone, get her to the kitchen. He then led Spinelotra's wife into the chamber, and locked the door. Hearing the key turn in the lock, "'Alas!' quoth the lady, "'what means this, Zeppa? "'Is't for this ye have brought me here? "'Is this the love you bear, Spinelotro? "'Is this your loyalty to him as your friend and comrade?' By the time she had done speaking, Zeppa, still keeping fast hold of her, was beside the chest, in which her husband was locked. Wherefore, Madam, quoth he, spare me thy reproaches, until thou hast heard what I have to say to thee. I have loved, I yet love, Spinelotro as a brother, and yesterday, though he knew it not, I discovered that the trust I reposed in him has for its guerdon that he lies with my wife, as with thee. Now, for that I love him, I purpose not to be avenged upon him, save in the sort in which he offended. He has had my wife, and I intend to have thee. So thou wilt not grant me what I crave of thee, be sure I shall not fail to take it, and having no mind to let this affront pass unavenged, will make such play with him that neither thou nor he shall ever be happy again. The lady hearkening, and by dint of his repeated asseverations, coming at length to believe him, Zeppa mine, quoth she, as this thy vengeance is to light upon me, well content am I, so only thou let not this, which we are to do, embroil me with thy wife, with whom, notwithstanding the evil turn she has done me, I am minded to remain at peace. Have no fear on that score, replied Zeppa. Nay, I will give thee into the bargain a jewel so rare and fair that thou hast not the like. Which said, he took her in his arms and fell to kissing her, and having laid her on the chest in which her husband was safe under lock and key, did there disport himself with her to his heart's content, as she with him. Spinelotro in the chest heard all that Zeppa had said, and how he was answered by the lady, and the trevisan dance that afterwards went on over his head. Whereat his mortification was such that for a great while he scarce hoped to live through it, and but for the fear he had of Zeppa, he would have given his wife a sound rating, close prisoner though he was. But as he besought him, that twas he that had given the first affront, and that Zeppa had good cause for acting as he did, and that he had dealt with him considerately, and as a good fellow should, he resolved that if it were agreeable to Zeppa, they should be faster friends than ever before. However, Zeppa, having had his pleasure with the lady, got down from the chest, and being reminded by the lady of his promise of the jewel, opened the door of the chamber, and brought his wife in. Quoth she with a laugh, "'Madam, you have given me tit for tat,' and never a word more. 
whereupon, "'Open the chest,' quoth Zeppa, and she obeying, he showed the lady her spinelocho lying therein. "'Twould be hard to say whether of the twain was the more shame-stricken, spinelocho to be confronted with Zeppa, knowing that Zeppa wist what he had done, or the lady to meet her husband's eyes, knowing that he had heard what went on above his head. "'Lo, here is the jewel I give thee,' quoth Zeppa to her, pointing to Spinilocho, who, as he came forth of the chest, blurted out, "'Zeppa, we are quits, and so twere best, as thou saidst a while ago to my wife, that we still be friends as we were wont, and as we had naught separate save our wives, that henceforth we have them also in common.' Content, quoth Zeppa, and so in perfect peace and accord they all four breakfasted together. And thenceforth each of the ladies had two husbands, and each of the husbands two wives, nor was there ever the least dispute or contention between them on that score. End of day eight, the eighth story. Day eight, the ninth story of the Decameron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio. Translated by J. M. Rigg. Day eight, the ninth story. Bruno and Buffalmacco prevail upon Master Simone, a physician, to betake him by night to a certain place, there to be enrolled in a company that go the course. Buffalmacco throws him into a foul ditch, and there they leave him. When the ladies had made merry a while, over the partnership in wives established by the two Cines, the queen, who now, unless she were minded to infringe Dionio's privilege, alone remained to tell, began on this wise. Fairly earned indeed, loving ladies, was the flout that Spinelloccio got from Zeppa. Wherefore my judgment jumps with that which Pampinea expressed a while ago, to wit, that he is not severely to be censured who bestows a flout on one that provokes it, or deserves it. And, as Spinelloccio deserved it, so tis my purpose to tell you of one that provoked it. For I deem that those from whom he received it were rather to be commended than condemned. The man that got it was a physician, who, albeit he was but a blockhead, returned from Bologna to Florence in a mantle and hood of vair. Tis matter of daily experience that our citizens come back to us from Bologna, this man a judge, that a physician, and the other a notary, flaunting it in ample flowing robes, and adorned with the scarlet and the vair and other array most goodly to see, and how far their doings correspond with this fair seeming, is also a matter of daily experience. Amongst whom tis not long since Master Simone da Villa, one whose patrimony was more ample than his knowledge, came back wearing the scarlet and a broad stripe on the shoulder, and a doctor, as he called himself, and took a house in the street that we now call Via del Cocomero. Now this Master Simone, being thus, as we said, come back, had this, among other singular habits, that he could never see a soul pass along the street, but he must needs ask any that was by who that man was. And he was as observant of all the doings of men, and as sedulous to store his memory with such matters, as if they were to serve him to compound the drugs that he was to give his patients. Now, of all that he saw, those that he eyed most observantly were two painters, of whom here to-day mention has twice been made, Bruno, to wit, and Buffalmacco, who were ever together, and were his neighbours. And as it struck him that they daffed the world aside, and lived more light-heartedly than any others that he knew, as indeed they did, he inquired of not a few folk as to their rank. And learning on all hands that they were poor men and painters, he could not conceive it possible that they should live thus contentedly in poverty, but made his mind up that, being, as he was informed, clever fellows, they must have some secret source from which they drew immense gains, for which reason he grew all agog to get on friendly terms with them, or at any rate with one of them, and did succeed in making friends with Bruno. Bruno, who had not needed to be much with him in order to discover that this physician was but a dolt, 
had never had such a jolly time in palming off his strange stories upon him, while the physician, on his part, was marvellously delighted with Bruno, to whom, having bidden him to breakfast, and thinking that for that reason he might talk familiarly with him, he expressed the amazement with which he regarded both him and Buffalmacco, for that, being but poor men, they lived so light-heartedly, and asked him to tell him how they managed. At which fresh proof of the doctor's simplicity and fatuity, Bruno was inclined to laugh, but, bethinking him that to best to answer him according to his folly, he said, "'Master, there are not many persons to whom I would disclose our manner of life, but, as you are my friend, and I know you will not let it go further, I do not mind telling you. The fact is that my comrade and I live not only as light-heartedly and jovially as you see, but much more so, and yet neither our art nor any property that we possess yields us enough to keep us in water. Not that I would have you suppose that we go a-thieving. No, tis that we go the course, and thereby without the least harm done to a soul we get all that we need, nay, all that we desire, and thus it is that we live so light-heartedly as you see." which explanation the doctor believing, none the less readily than he knew not what it meant, was lost in wonder, and forthwith burned with a most vehement desire to know what going the course might be, and was instant with Bruno to expound it, assuring him that he would never tell a soul. "'Alas, master,' said Bruno, "'what is this you ask of me? "'Tis a mighty great secret you would have me impart to you.' "'Twould be enough to undo me, to send me packing out of the world, "'nay, into the very jewels of Lucifer of San Gallo, if it came to be known. "'But such is the respect in which I hold your quidditative pumpkinship of Lignaya, "'and the trust I repose in you, that I am not able to deny you aught you ask of me. "'And so I will tell you, on condition that you swear by the cross at Montessoni "'that you will keep your promise and never repeat it to a soul.' The master gave the required assurance, whereupon, "'You are then to know,' quoth Bruno, "'sweet my master, that tis not long since there was in this city a great master in necromancy, hight Michael Scott, for that he was of Scotland, and great indeed was the honour in which he was held by not a few gentlemen, most of whom are now dead, and when the time came that he must needs depart from Florence, he, at their instant entreaty, left behind him two pupils, adepts both, whom he bade hold themselves ever ready to pleasure those gentlemen who had done him honour. And very handsomely they did serve the said gentlemen in certain of their love affairs and other little matters, and finding the city and the manners of the citizens agreeable to them, they made up their minds to stay here always, and grew friendly and very intimate with some of the citizens, making no distinction between gentle and simple, rich or poor, so only they were such as were conformable to their ways and to gratify these their friends they formed a company of perhaps twenty-five men to meet together at least twice a month in a place appointed by them where when they are met each utters his desire and forthwith that same night they accomplish it now buffal macco and i being extraordinarily great and close friends with these two adepts were by them enrolled in this company and are still members of it and I assure you that as often as we are assembled together, the adornments of the saloon in which we eat are a marvel to see. Ay, and the tables laid as for kings, and the multitudes of stately and handsome servants, as well women as men, at the beck and call of every member of the company, and the basins and the ewers, the flasks and the cups, and all else that is there for our service in eating and drinking, of naught but gold and silver and therewithal the abundance and variety of the viands suited to the taste of each that are set before us, each in due course, these two be marvels. To a vain to me to seek to describe to you the sweet concord that there is of innumerable instruments of music, and the tuneful songs that salute our ears, nor might I hope to tell you of how much wax is burned at these banquets, or compute the quantity of the comfits that are eaten, or the value of the wines that are drunk, nor, my pumpkin of wit, would I have you suppose that, when we are there, we wear our common clothes, such as you now see me wear. Nay, there is none there so humble, but he shows as an emperor, so sumptuous are our garments, so splendid our trappings. But, 
among all the delights of the place, none may compare with the fair ladies, who, so one do but wish, are brought thither from every part of the world. Why, you might see there my lady of the Barbonics, the queen of the Basques, the consort of the Soldan, the empress of Osbeck, the Chanchanfera of Norniaca, the Semistanti of Berlinzone, and the Scalpedra of Narcia. But why seek to enumerate them all? They include all the queens in the world. I, even to the skinky moor of Presto John, who has the horns sprouting out of another end. So there's for you. Now, when these ladies have done with the wine and the comfits, they tread a measure or two, each with the manner whose behest she has come, and then all go with their gallants to their chambers, and know that each of these chambers shows as a very paradise, so fair is it, ay, and no less fragrant than the cases of aromatics in your shop when you are pounding the cumin. And therein are beds, that you would find more goodly than that of the Doge of Venice, and tis in them that we take our rest. And how busily they ply the treadle, and how lustily they tug at the frame to make the stuff close and compact, I leave you to imagine. However, among the luckiest of all, I reckon Buffalmacco and myself, for that Buffalmacco, for the most part, fetches him the Queen of France, and I do the like with the Queen of England, who are just the finest women in the world, and we have known how to carry it with them, so that we are the very eyes of their heads. So, I leave it to your own judgment to determine whether we have not good cause to live and bear ourselves with a lighter heart than others, seeing that we are beloved of two such great queens, to say nothing of the thousand or two thousand foreigns that we have of them whenever we are so minded. Now, all this in the vulgar we call go in the course, because, as the Corsairs prey upon all the world, so do we, albeit with this difference, that whereas they never restore their spoil, we do so as soon as we have done with it. So now, my worthy master, you understand what we mean by going the course, but how close it behoves you to keep such a secret you may see for yourself, so I spare you any further exhortations. The master whose skill did not reach perhaps beyond the treatment of children for the scurf, took all that Bruno said for gospel, and burned with so vehement a desire to be admitted into this company, that he could not have longed for the summum bonum itself with more ardour. So, after telling Bruno that indeed twas no wonder they bore them light-heartedly, he could scarce refrain from asking him there and then to have him enrolled, albeit he deemed it more prudent to defer his suit, until by lavishing honour upon him he had gained a right to urge it with more confidence. He therefore made more and more of him, had him to breakfast and sup with him, and treated him with extraordinary respect. In short, such and so constant was their intercourse that it seemed as though the master wist not how to live without Bruno. And as it went so well with him, Bruno, to mark his sense of the honour done him by the doctor, painted in his saloon a picture symbolical of Lent, and an annus dei at the entrance of his chamber, and an alembic over his front door, that those who would fain consult him might know him from other physicians, besides a battle of rats and mice in his little gallery, which the doctor thought an extremely fine piece. And from time to time, when he had not supped with the master, he would say to him, Last night I was with the company, and, being a little tired of the Queen of England, I fetched me the Gumedra of the great can of Teresi. Gumedra, quoth the master, what is she? I know not the meaning of these words. Thereat, master, replied Bruno, I marvel not, for I have heard tell that neither Porca Grasso nor Vanicenna say aught thereof. Thou wouldst say Hippocraso and Avicenna returned the master. "'If faith, I know not,' quoth Bruno. "'I as ill know the meaning of your words as you of mine, but Gumedra, in the speech of the great can, signifies the same as Empress in ours. Ah, oh, a fine woman you would find her, and plenty of her. I warrant she would make you forget your drugs and prescriptions and plasters.' And so Bruno, from time to time whetting the master's appetite, and the master at length thinking that by his honourable entreatment of him he had fairly made a conquest of Bruno, it befell that one evening, while he held the light for Bruno, who was at work on the battle of rats and mice, 
he determined to discover to him his desire, and as they were alone, thus he spoke. "'God knows, Bruno, that there lives not the man for whom I would do as much as for thee. Why, if thou wast to bid me go all the way from here to Peritola, I almost think I would do so. Wherefore, I trust thou wilt not deem it strange if I talk to thee as an intimate friend and in confidence. Thou knowest tis not long since thou didst enlarge with me on thy gay company and their doings, which has engendered in me such a desire as never was to know more thereof. Nor without reason, as thou wilt discover, should I ever become a member of the said company, for I straightway give thee leave to make game of me, should I not then fetch me the fairest maid thou hast seen this many a day, whom I saw last year at Cacavincili, and to whom I am entirely devoted, and by the body of Christ I offered her ten Bolognese groats that she should pleasure me, and she would not. Wherefore, I do most earnestly entreat thee to instruct me what I must do to fit myself for membership in the company, and never doubt that in me you will have a true and loyal comrade, and one that will do you honour. And above all, thou seest how goodly I am of my person, and how well furnished with legs, and of face as fresh as a rose, and therewithal I am a doctor of medicine, and I scarce think you have any such among you, and not a little excellent lore I have, and many a good song by heart, of which I will sing thee one. And forthwith he fell a-singing. Bruno had such a mind to laugh, that he could scarce contain himself, but still he kept a grave countenance, and when the master had ended his song, and said, How likes it thee? He answered, Verily no lyre of straw could vie with you, so artigutically you refine your strain. "'I warrant thee,' returned the master, "'thou hadst never believed it, hadst thou not heard me.' "'Aye, indeed, sooth sayst thou,' quoth Bruno. "'And I have other songs to boot,' said the master, "'but enough of this at present. "'Thou must know that I, such as thou seest me, "'am a gentleman's son, "'albeit my father lived in the Contado, "'and on my mother's side I come of the Vallecchio family.' and, as thou mayst have observed, I have quite the finest library and wardrobe of all the physicians in Florence. God's faith, I have a robe that cost, all told, close upon a hundred pounds in bagatines more than ten years ago. Wherefore I make most instant suit to thee that thou get me enrolled, which, if thou do, God's faith, be thou never so ill, thou shalt pay me not a stiver for my attendance of thee. Whereupon Bruno, repeating to himself, as he had done many a time before, that the doctor was a very numbskull. Master, quoth he, show a little more light here, and have patience until I have put the finishing touches to the tails of these rats, and then I will answer you. So he finished the tails, and then, putting on an air as if he were not a little embarrassed by the request, Master mine, quoth he, I should have great things to expect from you, that I know, but yet what you ask of me, albeit to your great mind it seems but a little thing, is a weighty matter indeed for me, nor know I a soul in the world to whom, though well able, I would grant such a request, save to you alone. And this I say not for friendship's sake alone, albeit I love you as I ought, but that your discourse is so fraught with wisdom that tis enough to make a begin start out of her boots, much more than to incline me to change my purpose. And the more I have of your company, the wiser I repute you. Whereto I may add that, if for no other cause, I should still be well disposed towards you for the love I see you bear to that fair piece of flesh of which you spoke but now. But this I must tell you, tis not in my power to do as you would have me in this matter. But, though I cannot myself do the needful in your behalf, if you will pledge your faith, whole and solid as may be, to keep my secret, I will show you how to go about it for yourself, and I make no doubt that, having this fine library and all the other matters you spoke of a while ago, you will compass your end. Quoth then the master, Nay, but speak freely. I see thou dost yet scarce know me, and how well I can keep a secret. There were few things that Messer Gasparolo de Saliceto did, when he was Podestaro for Popoli, that he did not confide to me, so safe he knew they would be in my keeping. And wouldst thou be satisfied that I say sooth? I assure you 
that I was the first man whom he told that he was about to marry Bergamina, so there's for thee. Well and good, said Bruno, if such as he confided in you, well, indeed, may I do the like. Know, then, that you will have to proceed on this wise. Our company is governed by a captain and a council of two, who are changed every six months, and on the calends without fail Buffal Macco will be captain, and I councillor. Tis so fixed. And the captain has not a little power to promote the admission and enrolment of whomsoever he will. Wherefore, methinks, you would do well to make friends with Buffal Macco, and honourably entreat him. He is one that, marking your great wisdom, will take a mighty liking to you forthwith. And when you have just a little dazzled him with your wisdom and these fine things of yours, you may make your request to him, and he will not know how to say no. I have already talked with him of you, and he is as well disposed to you as may be, and having so done, you will leave the rest to me. Whereupon, Thy words are to me for an exceeding great joy, quoth the master. And if he be one that loves to converse with sages, he has but to exchange a word or two with me, and I will answer for it that he will be ever coming to see me. For so fraught with wisdom am I, that I could furnish a whole city therewith, and still remain a great sage. Having thus set matters in train, Bruno related the whole affair, point by point, to Buffalmacco, to whom it seemed a thousand years till he should be able to give Master Noodle that of which he was in quest. The doctor, now all agog to go the course, lost no time and found no difficulty in making friends with Buffalmacco, and fell to entertaining him, and Bruno likewise, at breakfast and supper, in most magnificent style, while they fooled him to the top of his bent, for, being gentlemen that appreciated excellent wines and fat capons, besides other good cheer in plenty, they were inclined to be very neighbourly, and needed no second bidding, but, always letting him understand that there was none other whose company they relished so much, kept ever with him. However, in due time the master asked of Buffalmacco that which he had before asked of Bruno, whereat Buffalmacco feigned to be not a little agitated, and turning angrily to Bruno, made a great pother about his ears, saying, "'By the most high God of Passignano, I vow I can scarce forbear to give thee that over the head that should make thy nose fall about thy heels. Traitor that thou art! For it is thou alone that canst have discovered these secrets to the master.' Whereupon the master interposed with no little vigour, averring with oaths that twas from another source that he had gotten his knowledge, and Buffalmacco at length allowed himself to be pacified by the sage's words. So, turning to him, "'Master,' quoth he, "'tis evident indeed that you have been at Bologna, and have come back hither with a mouth that blabs not, and that twas on no pippin, as many a dolt does, but on the good long pumpkin that you learned your ABC, and, if I mistake not, you were baptised on a Sunday, and though Bruno has told me that twas medicine you studied there, tis my opinion that you there studied the art of catching men, of which, what with your wisdom and your startling revelations, you are the greatest master that ever I knew. He would have said more, but the doctor, turning to Bruno, broke in with, Ah, what it is to consort and converse with the wise! Who but this worthy man would thus have read my mind through and through? Less quick by far to rate me at my true worth was thou. But what said I when thou toldst me that Buffalmacco delighted to converse with sages? Confess now. Have I not kept my word? Verily, quoth Bruno, you have more than kept it. Then, addressing Buffalmacco, Ah! cried the master, what hast thou said? Hadst thou seen me at Bologna, where there was none, great or small, doctor or scholar, but was devoted to me? So well wist I how to entertain them with my words of wisdom. Nay, more, let me tell thee that there was never a word I spoke but set every one a laughing, so great was the pleasure it gave them. And at my departure they all deplored it most bitterly, and would have had me remain, and by way of inducement went so far as to propose that I should be sole lecturer to all the students in medicine that were there, which offer I declined, for that I was minded to return hither, having vast estates here, that have ever belonged to my family, which accordingly I did. Quoth then Bruno to Buffalmacco, how shows it now, man, 
thou didst not believe me when I told thee what he was. By the Gospels there is never a physician in this city that has the law of asses urine by heart as he has. Verily thou wouldst not find his like between here and the gates of Paris. Now see if thou canst help doing as he would have thee. "'Tis even as Bruno says," observed the doctor, "'but I am not understood here. You Florentines are somewhat slow of wit. Would you could see me in my proper element among a company of doctors?" Whereupon, of a truth, master, quoth Buffalmacco, your law far exceeds any I should ever have imputed to you. Wherefore, addressing you as tis meet to address a man of your wisdom, I give you disjointedly to understand that without fail I will procure your enrolment in our company. After this promise, the honours lavished by the doctor upon the two men grew and multiplied, in return for which they diverted themselves by setting him a prancing upon every wildest chimera in the world, and promised, among other matters, to give him by way of mistress the Countess of Civilari whom they averred to be the goodliest creature to be found in all the Netherlands of the human race, and the doctor asking who this countess might be. "'Mature my gherkin,' quoth Buffalmacco. "'She is indeed a very great lady, and few houses are there in the world in which she has not some jurisdiction. Nay, the very friars' minors, to say naught of other folk, pay her tribute to the sound of the kettle-drum.' and i may tell you that when she goes abroad she makes her presence very sensibly felt albeit for the most part she keeps herself close however tis no great while since she passed by your door one night on her way to the arno to bathe her feet and get a breath of air but most of her time she abides at laterina sergeants has she not a few that go there round at short intervals bearing one and all the rod and the bucket in token of her sovereignty and barons are plenty in all parts, as Tamanino de la Porta, Don Meta, Manico di Scopa, Squacera, and others, with whom I doubt not you are intimately acquainted, though you may not just now bear them in mind. Such, then, is the great lady, in whose soft arms we, if we delude not ourselves, will certainly place you, in which case you may well dispense with her of Cacavincigli. The doctor, who had been born and bred at Bologna, and understood not their words, found the lady quite to his mind, and shortly afterwards the painters brought him tidings of his election into the company. Then came the day of the nocturnal gathering, and the doctor had the two men to breakfast, and when they had breakfasted, he asked them after what manner he was to join the company. Whereupon, lo now, master, quoth Buffalmarco, you have need of a stout heart. Otherwise you may meet with some let to our most grievous hurt, and for what cause you have need of this stout heart, you shall hear. You must contrive to be to-night, about the hour of first sleep, on one of the raised tombs that have been lately placed outside of Santa Maria Novella, and mind that you wear one of your best gowns, so that your first appearance may impress the company with a proper sense of your dignity, and also because, as we are informed, for we were not present at the time, the countess, by reason that you are a gentleman, is minded to make you a knight of the bath at her own charges. So you will wait there until one whom we shall send come for you, who, that you may know exactly what you have to expect, will be a beast, black and horned, of no great size, and he will go snorting and bounding amain about the piazza in front of you, with intent to terrify you. But when he perceives that you are not afraid, he will draw nigh you quietly, and when he is close by you, then get you down from the tomb, fearing nothing, and minding you neither of God nor of the saints, mount him. And when you are well set on his back, then fold your arms upon your breast, as in submission, and touch him no more. Then go in gently, he will bear you to us. But once mind you of God or the saints, or give way to fear, and I warn you, he might give you a fall or dash you against something that you would find scarce pleasant. Wherefore, if your heart misgives you, you were best not to come, for you would assuredly do yourself a mischief, and us no good at all. Quoth then the doctor, You know me not as yet. Tis perchance because I wear the gloves and the long robe that you misdoubt me. Ah, did you but know what feats I have done in times past at Bologna, when I used to go after the women with my comrades, you would be lost in amazement. God's faith! 
On one of those nights there was one of them, a poor, sickly creature she was too, and stood not a cubit in height, who would not come with us. So first I treated her to many a good cuff, and then I took her up by main force and carried her well nigh as far as a crossbow will send a bolt, and so caused her willy-nilly come with us. And on another occasion I mind me that, having none other with me but my servant, a little after the hour of Ave Maria, I passed by the cemetery of the Friars Minors, and though that very day a woman had been there interred, I had no fear at all. So on this score you may make your minds easy, for indeed I am a man of exceeding great courage and prowess, and to appear before you with due dignity, I will don my scarlet gown, in which I took my doctor's degree, and it remains to be seen if the company will not give me a hearty welcome and make me captain out of hand. Let me once be there, and you will see how things will go. Else how is it that this countess that has not yet seen me is already so enamoured of me that she is minded to make me a knight of the bath? And whether I shall find knighthood agreeable, or know how to support the dignity well or ill, leave that to me. Whereupon, well said, excellent well said, quoth Buffalmacco. But look to it you disappoint us not, either by not coming, or by not being found when we send for you. And this I say, because tis cold weather, and you medical gentlemen take great care of your health. God forbid, replied the doctor. I am none of your chilly folk. I fear not the cold. Tis seldom, indeed, when I leave my bed at nights to answer the call of nature, as one must at times, that I do more than throw a pelisse over my doublet, so rest assured that I shall be there. So they parted, and towards nightfall the master found a pretext for leaving his wife, and privily got out his fine gown, which in due time he donned, and so hied him to the tombs, and having perched himself on one of them, huddled himself together, for twas mighty cold, to await the coming of the beast. Meanwhile, Buffalmaco, who was a tall man and strong, provided himself with one of those dominoes that were wont to be worn in certain revels which are now gone out of fashion, and, enveloped in a black pelisse turned inside out, showed like a bear, save that the domino had the face of a devil, and was furnished with horns. In which guise, Bruno following close behind to see the sport, he hied him to the piazza of Santa Maria Novella and no sooner wist he that the master was on the tomb than he fell a careering in a most wild and furious manner to and fro the piazza, and snorting and bellowing and gibbering like one demented, insomuch as that as soon as the master was ware of him, each several hair on his head stood on end, and he fell a trembling in every limb, being in sooth more timid than a woman, and wished himself safe at home. But, as there he was, he strove might and main to keep his spirits up, so overmastering was his desire to see the marvels of which Bruno and Buffalmacco had told him. However, after a while Buffalmacco allowed his fury to abate, and came quietly up to the tomb on which the master was, and stood still. The master, still all of a tremble with fear, could not at first make up his mind whether to get on the beast's back or no. But at length, doubting it might be the worse for him if he did not mount the beast, he overcame the one dread by the aid of the other, got down from the tomb, saying under his breath, God help me, and seated himself very comfortably on the beast's back, and then, still quaking in every limb, he folded his arms as he had been bidden. Buffalmaco now started, going on all fours at a very slow pace, in the direction of Santa Maria della Scala and so brought the master within a short distance of the convent of the ladies of Ripoli. Now, in that quarter there were diverse trenches, into which the husbandmen of those parts were wont to discharge the Countess of Civilari, that she might afterwards serve them to manure their land. Of one of which trenches, as he came by, Buffalmaco skirted the edge, and, seizing his opportunity, raised a hand and caught the doctor by one of his feet, and threw him off his back and head foremost right into the trench, and then, making a terrific noise and frantic gestures as before, went bounding off by Santa Maria della Scala towards the field of Ognissanti, where he found Bruno, who had betaken him thither that he might laugh at his ease, and there the two men in high glee took their stand to observe from a distance how the bemired doctor would behave. Finding himself in so loathsome a place, 
the master struggled might and main to raise himself and get out, and though again and again he slipped back, and swallowed some drams of the orgia, yet, bemired from head to foot, woe-begone and crestfallen, he did at last get out, leaving his hood behind him. Then, removing as much of the filth as he might with his hands, knowing not what else to do, he got him home, where, by dint of much knocking, he at last gained admittance. And scarce was the door closed behind the malodorous master, when Bruno and Buffalmacco were at it, all agog to hear after what manner he would be received by his wife. They were rewarded by hearing her give him the soundest rating that ever bad husband got. Ah, oh, quoth she, fine doings these! Thou hast been with some other woman, and wast minded to make a brave show in thy scarlet gown. So I was not enough for thee. Not enough for thee, forsooth, I that might contend a crowd. Would they had choked thee with the filth in which they have soused thee. Twas thy fit resting place. Now to think that a physician of repute and a married man should go by night after strange women. Thus, and with much more to the like effect, while the doctor was busy washing himself, she ceased not to torment him until midnight. On the morrow, Bruno and Buffalmacco, having painted their bodies all over with livid patches to give them the appearance of having been thrashed, came to the doctor's house, and finding that he was already risen, went in, being saluted on all hands by a foul smell, for time had not yet served thoroughly to cleanse the house. The doctor, being informed that they were come to see him, advanced to meet them and bade them good morning, whereto Bruno and Buffalmacco, having prepared their answer, replied, no good morning shall you have from us. Rather we pray God to give you bad years enough to make an end of you, seeing that there lives no more arrant and faithless traitor. Tis no fault of yours if we, that did our best to honour and pleasure you, have not come by a dog's death. Your faithlessness has cost us to-night as many sound blows as would more than suffice to keep an ass trotting all the way from here to Rome, besides which we have been in peril of expulsion from the company in which we arranged for your enrolment. If you doubt our words, look but at our bodies, what a state they are in! And so, baring their breasts, they gave him a glimpse of the patches they had painted there, and forthwith covered them up again. The doctor would have made them his excuses, and recounted his misfortunes, and how he had been thrown into the trench. But Buffalmacco broke in with, Would he have thrown you from the bridge into the Arno? Why must you needs mind you of God and the saints? Did we not forewarn you? "'God's faith,' returned the doctor, "'that I did not.' "'How?' quoth Buffalmacco. "'You did not? "'You do so above a little. "'Three that we sent for you told us "'that you trembled like an aspen "'and knew not where you were. "'You have played us a sorry trick, "'but never another shall do so, "'and as for you we will give you "'such requital thereof as you deserve.' "'The doctor now began to crave their pardon "'and to implore them for God's sake "'not to expose him to shame.' and used all the eloquence at his command to make his peace with them. And if he had honourably entreated them before, he thenceforth, for fear they should publish his disgrace, did so much more abundantly, and courted them both by entertaining them at his table and in other ways. And so you have heard how wisdom is imparted to those that get it not at Bologna. End of Day 8, the Ninth Story